As you can tell from my accent, I come from Derry, and uh, I uh, grew up in an area called the Craigan Estate. And back in the late 60s, early 70s, Craigan and Northern Ireland was plunged into a conflict. And the Craigan was at the epicenter of that conflict. Outside our front door, shootings, bombings, riots were a daily occurrence. In January 1972, you had a very famous but sad incident in Derry where 13 innocent people were shot dead by the British Army on the streets of Derry. Arguably, the weeks and months that followed Bloody Sunday were among the most violent period of the Northern Ireland conflict. I went to Rosemount Primary School, which was on the edge of the Craigan, and beside the school was a British Army installation. On the 4th of May 1972, I got out of school as normal, and uh, me and me friends started to race along the bottom of the school football pitch. I was only 10 years of age at the time. As we did so, I had to pass this British Army lookout post on my right-hand side. As uh, I was about 10 feet away from it, and a British soldier fired a rubber bullet. It hit me here in the bridge of the nose. I lost this eye, was left completely blind in my left eye. So I'm blind now, 47 years. I spent two weeks in hospital. All during my time in hospital, I thought that I couldn't see because of the bandages on my eyes. So it was about a month after I was shot, I was out home. And my brother Noel took me for a walk up and down our back garden. And this particular day, he said to me, Richard, do you know what has happened? And I said, yes, and you were shot. He said, do you know what damage was done? And I said, no. And that's when he told me that I would be blind for the rest of my life. And to be honest with you, I literally took it my stride that day until I went to bed that night. And when I was in bed on my own, I cried for the one and only time that I remember about blindness. And I cried because I realised for the first time that I was never going to actually see my mommy and daddy again. As opposed to a 10 year old boy, you don't think about the bigger things in life. I just missed the fact that I couldn't see my parents' faces again. And I cried myself to sleep that night. The next day, I woke up, got out of bed, and began to put the pieces of my life back together. I went back to the school I was at Rosemount Primary School, then I went on to St. Joseph's Secondary School, done all the exams there, went to university, got my degree in 1983, got married in 1984, got separated in 1985. <laughs> I'm only joking about that. <laughs> well, I think I am. But, uh, I have two children, Neve and Enya. Neve's 30 years of age now, and Enya's 27. And I've done a lot of things after I was shot. I was compensated by the British government, and we, um, with half the money, I bought a house, and with the other half, I bought a pub. And two years later, I bought a second pub. So by the time I was 20 years of age, I owned two pubs in the centre of Derry. I didn't even drink. <laughs> But uh, I also um, learned how to play the guitar after I was shot. I used to play in bands, semi-professional, all over Ireland, really. And uh, me and my girlfriend then, my wife Rita, we set up a folk choir that sang at Mass every Saturday night. We still do that 40 years later. And um, I, w I was, a, like every young boy, I was a football fanatic. I would have kicked a Coke can around the street just to play football. And I suppose I kept my interest up in football because uh, in the mid-90s, I, um, I became a director of Derry City Football Club. And I'm sure you all heard of Derry City Football Club. It's, a, it's the biggest club on the planet, as you know. And uh, the last time I was a director of Derry City Football Club back in the 90s, they were champions of Ireland. So it was a great experience. But. Um, why am I telling you all of that in a very short space of time, sort of giving you a potted history of my life up to that point? The reason why I do that 
is to acknowledge the things in my life that made it possible. For me, not only the you know, survive blindness, being shot and blinded, but they actually see blindness as a positive experience. I actually don't mind being blind. In fact, sometimes I quite enjoy being blind. It's great when you have to do talks like this because I, I don't have to look at you lad. I just think I'm in the living room. The only difference when you're in the living room, nobody laughs at your jokes. But, um, but, you know, the reason why I think I bounced back so well was because I come from a good family. I also come from a good community. My family and my community were the people that put me back together. And a third thing, I suppose, would be that despite the poverty and despite the challenges that existed in Derry and Northern Ireland, the fact that I was blind, I was able to go back to school and get an education for myself. And it was in my young adult years that I became very aware of, you know, children in other parts of the world that might have had their eyesight, but didn't have what I had. So eventually, I sold out the business and I set up a charity called Children in Crossfire. And I suppose Children in Crossfire focuses on children that suffer from the injustice of poverty. Children that wake up every day and don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Children that suffer from waterborne diseases, hunger. They're deprived or deprived of basic human rights every day of their lives. I started Children in Crossfire back in 96. So we're going now 23 years. Today we work in Tanzania and Ethiopia mainly, and we provide access to preschool education and also health projects as well. I would encourage you to look up the Children of Crossfire website if you get a chance, childrenofcrossfire.org. Now, I'm not the only person that suffered as a result of my blindness. My mommy and daddy, suffered enormously. You know, my parents were two very religious people. They didn't support violence in any way, but despite their best efforts to avoid the troubles, the troubles found us. And you know, um, my mommy's brother was shot dead on Bloody Sunday, my Uncle Jared, and that was January 72. And three months later, I was blinded at the bottom of a school playground. And I remember when I got out of hospital, lying in my bed at night, and my mommy thought I was sleeping, and she'd come up and kneel beside my bed, and she would start to say her prayers. And um, then she would break down and start to cry, and the crying would get out of control. And she'd be saying things like, look at him, God, he's only a 10-year-old boy. Please give him back his eyesight. Please give him back his eyesight. For me, I'm a very happy and contented blind person. I told you that already. But I wouldn't be telling you the truth if it didn't amount to the fact that there are times in my life when I miss my eyesight. For example, when my two daughters were born. I was there in the ward when they came into the ward for the first time. You know, and I couldn't see them. When they smiled for the first time. When they opened their eyes for the first time. I couldn't see them. And I remember sitting in the Craig and Chapel when they made their first communions and their confirmations. And anybody that's not from the Catholic faith, that's a big day in anybody's family. And they walked down the aisle in their beautiful dresses and everybody telling me how beautiful they looked. And I couldn't see them. In those moments, I thought about the British soldier that shot me. You're doing something now that I will never be able to do. You're looking at a photograph of my children. You know what my children look like. I'll never know that. That's the legacy of violence. That's the legacy of war. And you've got to ask yourself, is it worth it? It's not worth it for me. But despite all of that, I never had a moment's anger 
and a, or a moment's hatred. And I want you to think about anger and hatred. It's a self-destruct emotion. It destroys you from the inside out. Somebody once described anger to me, it's like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. Well, I'm glad I didn't have that to the point where I wanted to meet the soldier that shot me. I didn't know his name until 33 years after the incident. I found out his name in 2005, and his name's Charles. And in January 2006, I flew to Scotland on my own and met Charles for the first time. And he sat in a hotel foyer opposite the man that blinded me for life and caused all those hurts to me and my family all those years ago. And to like him was an amazing experience. Me and Charles talked for four hours, three quarters that day, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I learned two things about forgiveness that day. The first thing is, forgiveness is first and foremost a gift that you give to yourself. What do I mean by that? If Charles wants my gift forgiveness, he has it. But that's not what's important. What's important for me and here, for my happiness, for my peace of mind, that I forgive him. The second thing about forgiveness is it doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. Again, you know, the fact that I forgive Charles isn't going to give me back my eyesight. It isn't going to take away all the hurts that were caused to me and my family all those years ago. But what it did do and has done has changed my future. And I genuinely don't believe that I would be the happy, contented person doing all the things that I've done with my life so far if I had been racked with anger, bitterness and hatred. I am a victim of the Northern Ireland conflict and there's nothing I can do about that. But I refuse to be a victim of anger and there's plenty I can do about that. I always say, you can take away somebody's eyesight but you can't take away their vision. And my vision is the work that I'm doing with children in Crossfire. Thank you very much.